my lack of height is. Uh, um, all right. Well, um, I'm. Hello. Hello. Now I'm hearing the reverb on this thing, so I'm just trying to. I don't want the echo. Okay. Um, It'll be okay. I mean, I don't even need a microphone. I can shout out like this, as my students well know. But, um, well, I'm trying to uh, read some things that are, uh, there are some things I've read here before, but it's been a long time, and, um, and I have kind of thematic issues here, so I'm just going to kind of run with it. I'm going to begin with this one poem that I don't believe I've read at this reading, um, and it's called uh, Horoscope. Um, and of course, you want to know what a horoscope is, I think. Perhaps she does. I don't know. Um, so, anyway, it's called horoscope. And at the end, there's kind of a pun on the word horoscope. I love crawling things. Peel bugs and ants. The husked cicada shining with dirt as it climbed the tallow trunk toward its breaking. On summer evenings, Huddled into the sweet cut grass, I watched stars crawl out of sunlight and creep west. But I walked early with impatience, dragging my braces like dried skin. Clocks, acrid as molasses, dripped seconds down the wall. So I learned to read for news about the stars, words strange and rapid as bat wings. My eyes opened to the last sentences of my life, having finally broken into my future, where clocks spin like quarters beneath repeating stars. I leave the last words for last, knowing at last their scope, their horror. Don't go to the audience with them. Oh, <laughs> I loved it. Oh, well, thank you. Okay, great, great. Um, so anyway, uh, you will learn that there's uh, many terrible things here that you're going to hear. So um, not terrible in the sense of poetry, but terrible in the sense of um, I like to write about terrible things that happen to me. So um, here's another one. Um, it's called Blues for the Stars. By the way, I hate this name. But uh, I was looking at this poem today, and I kind of like it. Um, yeah, these, the, these poems, the next uh, two poems are about marriage, okay? And, and not just about marriage, but about, you know, marriage that doesn't really work out very well. So this one is called Blues for the Stars. Once, after rain kept us apart all day, we met as new... Let me try this again. Once, after rain kept us apart all day, we met as new cold clipped. Let me try it one more time. I'm confusing myself with my own poetry. Once, after rain kept us apart all day, we met as new cold clipped the clouds from the night sky. And I showed your eyes, Orion, oh trace the stars of his belt as my hand tried its luck around your waist. Your white breath rose into my face, and we kissed like Eskimos. So many stars are dead, but still their light comes to us as though we deserved it. Tonight, a new lover in your dark eyes makes his milky way along your body. And I do not know do not know if you see Scorpio cock his sting in the south. I sit in another state. Night dew crawls like ants into my socks. All the while, starlight rises round us all like winter breath. Okay, this is an odd poem. Um, poets, you know, you always think of poetry as being about big ideas, but a good poet finds the little things 
and teases the big ideas out of them. Which I guess when I'm saying that I'm saying I'm a good poet, but I'm not really trying to say that. Um, but one day I was looking at toenail clippers, and so I wrote this poem that's called Toenail Clippers, which is at once about toenail clippers, because they're amazing. No, think about them. Who came up with toenail clippers? It's amazing. It's such a simple thing. And yet, I also, um, but also for me, they were sort of metaphorical for marriage. So, um, it's called toenail clippers. Wait, I missed that. The toenails were, or the toenail clippers were like marriage? The, the clippers are like marriage. Yeah, I get it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You'll see. The poem that kind of explains itself. So, you're not taking notes, are you? No. Thank God. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right, genius is minute. Take this. The hinged metal lies fast together like husband and wife rediscovering each other one sudden night. But separate the top from bottom and try to force them back together. Nails fly across the room. This subtle insight keeps us groomed, keeps us from drawing blood when our separate dreams press toes into our sleeping flesh. I just rediscovered this poem today. Um, and I even titled it. I read this thing, I'm like, ah, I'll go ahead and read it because it's a little bit of a change of pace. It's, um, it's called dating. And the last word, I hope you understand what the last word means. I'm not going to tell you because then it'll kind of give it away. Um, but um, anybody dated here before? Yeah? Only Billy has, only Dr. Fontenot has been dated. On dates. Like, what? I've been on dates. Oh, very good. Congratulations. <laughs> um, the um, dating is, um, God, I hate, hate dating. Or I hate it. I'm not dating anymore. I'm married. So theoretically, I'm not dating, right? Um, so anyway, the poem is called Dating. One girl met me over gin, another over wine, still another over diminutive cups of sake, and an another yet we touched together bottles of beer. This morning, among the lark's racket, I have made a vow of temperance. So, good to know that one's not working. Okay. <laughs> this one I do uh, like very much. Now we're beginning the religious section of the of the reading, and so I have four poems that are um, revealing of my sort of peculiar um, take on religiosity, I guess, spirituality. The first one is called, and I have read this here before, but uh, the first one is called Prayer. I hold a shell to my lips, my voice more wind than words, curls into its polished spiral. Something once lived in here, a dark, undoubted meat, but now I feel its absence with my need. The next one is, I don't know why I keep looking at you for, for responses. So. The next one is called Voice from the Cross, which I have not read here before. Very short. You know, Easter motif here. The Voice from the Cross. Ah, oh, well, never mind. That you ripped me wide, peeked inside me like a keyhole. I open nothing that's secret to you except this forgiveness. Thank you. This is one I'm always worried about with people because you have to kind of know the idea of taking the crucifix and putting palms behind it, right? 
you, you know this? Some of you? Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, um, and I had in my house one time um, crucifix and all of these palms. Year after year, a single palm stuck behind the crucifix. And they got very yellow, kind of brittle. And, um, hey, how's it going? Hey. All right. Um, <laughs> And so I looked at them, and it was like, you know, they're like fingers, like fingers of a hand, and behind that would be a palm, and these are palm leaves. So I decided I would write a poem that kind of played off of that, so it's called Palms. And uh, by the way, the Christ that I had on mine was pewter, so. Behind the pewter shoulders, they come together, then spread again, like fingers above the inscription. I've nailed this to the wall. I've wedged each year between the wood and metal a green and watered blade and watched them drain to beige and brittle. Why have I fixed it there, like a greeting? What am I expecting? A hammer? I think I was being nice. Now this one is another sort of religious and marriage poem at the same time. I apparently, <clears throat> apparently have a terrible uh, habit. In fact, I was reminded of that this morning. That I um, I snore terribly. Um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So um, I wrote this poem called Snoring. She touches me to turn away the thunder of the sinuses. If not touch, then church words, quiet. If the magic works, I sleep. So, if the magic works, she sleeps. If not, I sleep, alone. <laughs> I try to tell her that this goes back to Adam to the day when eyes first saw the quiet lightning and did not know what it preceded. Dust that day was spoken into life by the great mouth, which yawns now out of earshot, while we lie in dark beds, still choking on that first word. Okay, now uh, I have a few poems about my son. Here's, uh, well, you'll find out. The first two are when he was very young. And <coughs> the last one is, um, it's kind of a raw poem. It's one that I'm probably going to have a hard time reading. Anyway. The first one is called uh, Departing Love Field, Arriving in Colorado. Um, Love Field is in Dallas. That's where I was living at the time. And he was flying off to me to, to spend some time over the summer with his grandparents. And um, at this point, his mother and I were not doing very well. So um, I wrote this. It's called uh, yeah, Departing Love Field, Arriving in Colorado. The big metal goes up like a fever. Once, in Colorado, all the white night, I held your temperature to my chest, wanting so much to break your heat into me that I almost broke your bones. Crying at first, then too wrung out to wail, and lying limp in my arms, you began to sweat your teeth. When you come down in the snaggled landscape of your grandparents, Two hours from now, eight years from then, alone with a bag of animals and a pin claiming you as ward of the airline. Other arms will greet you, and you will accept from them the gentle embrace with a mouthful of teeth. I probably should have mentioned he was teething at the time. That's kind of all the teeth references. You know, when you're a parent, you have terrible fears that maybe you're doing 
terrible things that will screw up your children. And so, <clears throat> I wrote this poem because at one point I had terrible fears that I was doing terrible things to my child. So it's called Sun, and I have to read the title as part of the poem because it's Sun, comma, because it is the first line. Sun, remember when I boxed you up and you fought your way out of the cardboard flaps like a retailer's dream? a giggling appliance that won't stay stocked. One day, when you're curled in the dark of your own skin, looking for the flaps, you'll wonder if I put you there, and if I'm waiting in the light to applaud, if you ever find your way out. Uh, about um, this is the last of my son poems. About um, it's about sixteen. My uh, son started to cut himself, and it was um, minor originally, and then as it progressed, it got worse and worse and worse. So anyway, I wrote this poem. <clears throat> it's called Forever. Um, forever in quotes for the word. Um, but at any rate, it's called Forever. As a boy, they told me, you will regret this forever. And they were right. I do. But how could I have known when my always was 10 years, 15 years, and the school clock's hands were heavy with learning. Only now, when the matchstick numbers of a microwave's clock rapidly rearrange themselves, a game of shapes repeating, can I, in the scars of my own son's arms, read that word? The eloquence of his knife is irrefutable. I cannot tell him that, although the years will whiten his script of pain, it will be legible forever. He would not believe. And perhaps that is best, to see hope in their fading, instead of knowing a faded hope. And what do I regret? It doesn't matter. Forever is enough. Um, check the time, Dr. Fontenot, no, because I don't want to be. Uh, you're fine. Okay. Um, well, kind of a weird thing happened to me uh, about. I don't know, a year and a half ago, it was not last fall, but the fall before that, I found myself not being able to complete sentences when I was speaking. I don't know why this is the case, but I just suddenly would find myself getting to a word and then not being able to come up with the next word. It was very um, uh, frightening, uh, as you might imagine. And, you know, I knew the word, I just couldn't get it out. So, um, there was one sentence I was trying to say and I said the word they, and then I couldn't come up with the word afterwards. And um, so I wrote this poem, it's called The Silence After They. You're losing words. Caulk, for instance. As in, why did, why did they caulk the damn window shut? When you try to pass this sentence through your lips, after they, there follows Silence. There are beautiful silences. Falling stars, a hawk poised on midwinter air, wanderings in the tangled paint of Pollock, silences where sight breaks seen. But the silence after they, and other silences, other words that lose their grip on the words that came before, 
and let them fall from the cliff of the mouth without meaning. Salt, Thursday, syllabus, fingernail, Bill Evans. These are silences without beauty, that cannot bear beauty, because beauty needs being, and these silences, in these silences, nothing is. The summer sky blinks shut, and you sense the existence of absence, the glimpse of a whisper, the taste of the lack of salt on your tongue. This is chronic, a cough of the mind. You ask the typical questions. When did it begin? Where will it all end? You receive the usual replies. It is clear. Silence is what you're trying to say. And you will this. Um, I have two fairly new poems that I'm going to go ahead and read. And then I'm going to read it a couple, just two old poems, and then I'll be done. If that's okay with Dr. Fong. Okay. Um, this one's called Calling. It was uh, written because uh, over the spring break, uh, I was sitting at my computer and one of our cats caught a blue jay and was running around with it. And I could hear the blue jay just dying in the cat's mouth. And for some reason, it just, it, it, this was uh, troubling. And I could hear the mate calling for the blue jay. So I wrote this poem, it's called Calling. <coughs> I can hear the blue jay vainly twitter, calling for its mate, dead in the cat's mouth. This will go on for hours. I will clean the dishes, I will wash the clothes, I will sweep. All the while, the solitary listener to the song of loss pealing in the cold spring day. There is no escape from this. Losses, callings, except to become loss myself an absence after which someone calls then <clears throat> this is another one it's called um and there's no introduction to it it's just called um well introduction it's about about being in love. It's called Weathering Desire. I wait for you, for word, a far voice. It is the way one watches radar, seeing the dark red of the thunderheads wrapped in yellow and green bands moving closer, knowing the storm is coming and not knowing when. And then again, sometimes the bands slip north. And one is left watching the purple clouds, the desired darkness under a dry sky. <clears throat> Never would I have seen myself this way without you. The trembling pine unable to sway without breaking. My fingers on these keys constantly guilty of misstepping. Is this what a heart feels like when it is no longer one's own, but owned by others? Once there were no others, and there was peace, livable loneliness. Once I had darkness all to myself, and I took solace that others were like me in this, and so I made the weather I needed. It sufficed. Nothing is sufficient now. Instead, a trembling stillness waits for a compass's wind to fill it. Well, oh, hello, camera. <laughs> <laughs>
<coughs> nice to see you. Glad to know you're there. Um, okay, so I'm going to actually read a formal poem, which means that it's a poem that is in form, it rhymes, and adheres to certain, you know, uh, rhythmic uh, schemes and things like that. I have a number of these, I never read them, but anyway, this is, um, let's see, this is a poem that I wrote after some girl broke my heart. So, um, it's, it's what uh, Hemingway said, sentimental people are always having their hearts broken, so. Um, it's a sonnet, and I um, impressed my um, professor John Wood when I was in the MFA program there at McNeese, um, because in fact he showed it to the class and went on about how fantastic it was that I had written this brilliant sonnet and had done this brilliant technical move of adding a 15th line to the 14 line form. And the 15th line was perfect technically. And I never told him that I just lost count. <laughs> I mean, literally, I lost. I didn't know it was 15 until he told me. So, and um, the, um, the title of the poem, it terribly, terribly prosaic. It's called, anybody want to guess? No? No one dares? It's called Sonnet. <laughs> um, so anyway. Uh, and by the way, um, it's um, it's the product of somebody who has spent um, to the young poet who spent far too much time reading Dylan Thomas. Okay, so um, sonnet. She dreamed of dragon tail boys in motley who smelled of sea and the sheen of grass, and bounced her bauble eyes to where they lay in fields of endless sun, undone. In mass. We held hands, thought of our flesh being eaten sweetly by sinners. Oh, the lovely vice of bone and blood. I took the myth, the fallen restored to grace. It was the sacrifice I never saw. Her field never barren, no wine would transmute me. I could not cast my gold among the soft green blades and boys bowing their heads to you rising from fast flanks powerful as clouds they are your toys your aching liquid shape falls from my eyes i pray for waters sent to cleanse our lives Um, and uh, this is probably should be the last one because it's probably for time, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is the last one. Let's not even pretense to that. Um, and I have to go through this book that I had to turn in for my MFA thesis, so I have to find the poem. I thought I would read a love poem, like a really, you know, like an actual, like people think a love poem is. I have a real hard time with love poems. I write them all the time, but they never turn out like what you'd expect. Where it's really nice and the, um, the girl would be really happy to, to get the poem, right? So, um, uh, because I don't trust love poems. Because it's like, let's put it this way. This poem that I'm going to read, and by the way, this poem has this unhappy ending because I wrote it for a woman. Why? Why are you doing that? It's just different. No, no, no. The poem itself doesn't have an unhappy ending. The real life has an unhappy oh, ending. Okay? Yeah. Yes. Typical. Yeah, I wrote that. Yes, it, that is typical. You know, we all die. You know, it all does kind of end unhappily. Um, so anyway, I wrote this, and it really was very. Uh, you know, the girl I wrote it for, she liked it a lot, and uh, she wound up marrying me, and then she wound up divorcing me. So you see, it has an unhappy ending, right? So anyway, but the thing about the love poem is that, you know, you're kind of expressing how you feel. It's almost egotistical, the love poem. It really is. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's titled A Water Blessing for Denise, right? But it could just as easily be titled, I don't know, A Water Blessing for Carol, for example. And it wouldn't change anything here. So, you know, um, we could even call it a water blessing for Carol. I don't know. So, anyway, here's the poem. 
Not everything is fire with me. Though I have let your auburn bangs trace through me the fields of straw combed by lightning, know that too, I love the rain. If drops of my blood seared you, know that cool calcium is the frame of bleeding. You know the clench of my life, but at your bid, I give my palm, uncalloused and empty. Follow the lisp of lonely water, and find me falling like a stone spangled in a splash. As the easy blaze of summer burns me, so the dense absence of winter cools me to a healing, and designs me great to fill the corners of an empty world. I can snowbound your August, lay you cool with tulips, pass cloud after cloud across the sun. I can wash over you, feel the deepest parts of you, and hold you forever to glisten in blessing. Thank you very much.